So we are going to continue in the book of Paul that he wrote to the Galatians. We are now in chapter 3, chapter 3 of Galatians. I uh, kind of had told uh, you guys from the beginning there was like this central theme that runs through this. Uh, I like uh, the title that we see here, or at least what's on the screen. It says, The Gospel of Grace. To this point, Paul has done everything he can to defend, defend the gospel, the good news of grace, of God's unmerited favor. There had been those that had um, crept in to uh, these um, towns and cities known as Galatia, and Paul was concerned. They were preaching a message that was not the message that Paul had delivered to them. It was not the message that had saved them. It wasn't the message they heard that brought them to saving faith. Something different crept up. He calls them false teachers, and that's what they were. I love Paul in that, and I think it teaches us something as a church. That message of good news, that message of grace that saved us, we are to defend We are to do everything in our power to make sure no other message is communicated because what we would be doing if we do not defend the gospel of grace is that we would be saying that it's not enough, which means that what Christ did at Calvary's cross is not enough. And that is a lie that was uh, been uh, born out of the pits of hell itself. That's a message that comes from Satan. He would have you believe that somehow, some way, you have something to do with your salvation, and you don't. You only can respond to what is already done for you. We saw in the song, it's not who you are, it's who He is. It's not what I've done, it's what Christ has done. Amen? So I haven't started to preach, and I haven't got to the text yet. (laughs) Because that's how powerful it is. That's how great this message is. I said to you guys from the beginning, the gospel of grace which is that of Christ, is the good news of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. Nothing can be added to it. But the issue here is that there will always be those who will attempt to add to it, including those of us who are believers but are not well Taught. We can creep in and allow things to become part of our journey and our walk that have nothing to do with the gospel of grace. Amen? So, this is it right here. Let's say it together. Ready? The gospel of Christ is the good news of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Amen? How many of you agree with that? Say amen. That's the message of the whole epistle of Galatians that Paul wrote. So we're in chapter 3. We're going to look at um, probably uh, the first 14 verses, I think, (laughs) if I can get through them, right? But I do want to uh, look at the first verse together. Let's... Let's just kind of stand, and we're going to read the first verse since this is how we're going to begin. And, of course, I'm going to go verse by verse. I would have you notice that if Paul starts off by saying in verse 1 of chapter 3, O foolish Galatians, what he's referring to is their behavior. And if you act foolishly, we can see that this apostle is going to point it out. Okay, this is the truth. He points it out. He's not going to let it slide, especially because it impacts the gospel of grace. Amen? O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Amen? What was publicly portrayed? Jesus Christ crucified. In other words, 
the cross was preached. And the reason for the cross was preached. What the reason? We're sinners in need of a Savior. That's the reason. That's what he says. It's simple. We, we, we want to make it more difficult. We want to complicate things. And that's usually because of pride. We want to feel as if though we have contributed something, even if it's our own in intelligence, if you would, if our own ability to somehow be able to take what's simple and make it m more understandable, but there really isn't anything else to do. Uh, but our human nature is to want to add, let me say it again, our human nature, our pride, we want to add to what's done so we feel like we contributed. But in this particular case, salvation, there isn't anything we can contribute to it. It was a perfect and absolute wonderful uh, act of Christ at Calvary's cross that didn't need you or I, but we needed it. Amen? So let's pray for the sermon this morning. Thank you, Father, again for this opportunity, Lord, to hear the word preached and to accept what you have told us by faith. And that's what connects us to you. And that's what allows us to be able to enjoy so great a salvation that was secured for us by Jesus at Calvary's cross. Thank you. Help us to see that and only that. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the Apostle Paul is concerned about, you may have a seat, about what was happening in these uh, towns and these uh, cities known as Galatia. Remember, it's not one place. It's a region. It's in Greece today, what would be modern Greece. Uh, and you see, after he had shared the gospel with them, the good news of Jesus Christ, and left, because he continued on his missionary journeys, some people came in, some men came in, and they began to complicate the gospel. And they would say something like this, if, if I were to put this in like my own words. You know, guys... Paul's message is really cool. Paul's message is really, really cool. Then the next word comes in that basically says, it's really cool, but it's not enough. It would say, but it's not complete. Let me complete the message that Paul preached Hey, that's cool, but we need to add a few more things to it that you have to do. Okay, that's what was going on. So they were claiming that, oh, yeah, in addition to believing in Jesus, you must show that you're serious about him by keeping rules and regulations. That's what they were going to do. They were going to put legalism into the equation called salvation. And Paul is going to tear that preaching, that teaching apart in the next verses. So what he does here, he just says, oh, foolish Galatians. I looked at another translation, and it basically says, you fools. <laughs> Probably not going to be a mega church that he's going to have when the pastor starts the sermon by saying, you fools. But I'll, I'm going to have to be a little bit honest here, and I want to be transparent. I know there have been things that I have done in my Christian life where I myself have looked in the mirror and said to myself, you're a fool. <laughs> uh, maybe n this sermon isn't for anyone here at this church. I'm talking about the church that's down the aisle there, down the street. Hey, if you can't look at yourself sometimes and say, hey, I blew it, or uh, that was dumb, you know what I mean? If you can't look at yourself and laugh sometimes, even, you know what I'm saying, you're too full of pride. And someone needs to burst your bubble because Paul is that man. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. He was chosen by Jesus Christ himself. You're going to go to the Gentiles. 
You're going to take the gospel to the world. He established this church. He is the father, uh, spiritually speaking, of these believers. Yeah, get it off your chest. If you're in error, go ahead and say, that was foolish. In other words, don't live behind a mask believing that you're not if you're in error. Notice what I'm saying, the qualifying factor, if you're in error, right? Who has bewitched you? Then he takes it a step even further. And, and the word bewitched here is like borrowing from the Gentile world's experience with witchcraft. Basically saying, who put a spell on you? Like, who cast a spell on you? Who has bewitched you? Right? It, it, it's interesting uh, if we look at this because it's a rhetorical question. Paul here is trying to get them to see by questioning and rhetorically. They could, I guess, answer, that, you know, raise their hand and say, I, I, can ask a, I can answer that question. Those guys, those guys came in here and they preached this message where they told us that we had to be circumcised and they told us that we had to practice the Sabbath, that we had, you know what I mean? All the Jewish rules and regulations, rituals and traditions. You know that the Sabbath is completed in the work of Christ at Calvary's cross? We rest in the finished work, the perfect finished work of Christ. Every day we rest. That's why we don't have the Sabbath in, in the Christian church. That was given, remember, after creation, where the Lord rested? He didn't, after God created all the universe and the earth, He didn't rest on the seventh day because He was tired. Woo, man! That was seven days, man. I sure hope I get a little overtime. Man, don't they give any vacations around here? I think I'm going to make up a day called the Sabbath. No, he rested because his work was completed. That's why. And then the fall came. And guess what he had to do again? God had to go back to work again. To redeem fallen man. And what he did is he promised a man named Abraham that through his descendant, Christ, his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed because he would come and perform the labor of the cross, the work of the cross. And when Jesus completed his labor on the cross and said it was finished, that Sabbath is our rest. See, in Hebrews, it says, there, there remaineth the Sabbath. Yeah, the one in Christ. Every day is Sabbath for the Christian. Now, if you want to practice a day where you rest, go for it. Just don't say that's required. That's just what you want to do, and that's fine. You're free to do whatever you want. You can stand on your head all day if you want. Nobody can tell you you can't. Understand, though, it doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. It just has to do with you want more blood on your head, and maybe you'll think straight or better. I have a friend whose wife does that every morning. She says it's the weirdest thing. She goes and stands against the wall and is on, on her head. And I look at her, and I'm like, I'm going to roll back to bed. You know. But people have ideas. The point I'm trying to say is he's saying to them, who has bewitched you? He had presented to them. See what it says here. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed. This is not a secret message. This was a public message we preached. What was portrayed? What was pictured? This word is interesting, portrayed in the Greek. I looked it up. It could be translated today, billboard. Does anybody know what a billboard is? Hey, we literally put a billboard in your town and it shared with you the announcement 
We advertise Jesus crucified. That's what you learned. That's what the word portrayed here. We show that to you. And that is exactly why Paul is writing this letter, because they knew better. They had seen and understood and accepted the good news of Jesus Christ. And then he left, and someone came in and put a spell on them. That's what he's saying here. So, he's trying to say, hey, why is it that you are no longer embracing and enjoying the simplicity of the gospel? Okay? Why is it that you allowed yourself to be convinced, as if though a spell fell on you, that there's more to the message of salvation than what I already taught you. I know I'm, I'm, no, I'm digging around here a long time because I want to make it clear. That's exactly what was going on. It's a rhetorical question. Now, those of you that know what that means, it not necessarily needs to be answered, but it sh should be in your head. And I want to say this. I like Paul's style of questioning. I think as Christians, and my prayer as a teacher, and when I say that, uh, my profession is teaching. And I find that very few people there <laughs> in my high school <laughs> students and here ask questions. I think it's important for you to know that it's okay. Because, you know, a lot of people will say, I don't know if it's a good question. Now, this, is a not a, this is a dumb question. There are no dumb questions when it comes to growing in your knowledge of Christ. My prayer is that you guys would ask so many questions of me as a pastor that I would have to go back and look for things because it might be something, I'm sure, that it would stump me. You guys hear what I'm saying? This is a rhetorical question. Paul takes the defense of the gospel by using apologetics. It's a form of defending the gospel, which in one way we can see here is questioning. It's okay to question. God's not going to be offended by your questions. He's not going to be surprised by your doubts or your ignorance. Because the more I learn of Christ, the longer I walk this journey, which has been about 50 years, the more I realize I know nothing. Wow, well, Pastor, you've been doing it for so long and you know nothing. That's because it's so great. The Lord gave us his book, the Bible, and it's more than enough there to keep us busy for many lifetimes. If you care about your salvation, if you care about knowing about God, this is what I'm surprised at. Nobody's asking questions, whether it's about COVID-19 and its origin, whether it's about the elections, whether it's about, I don't care what it is, why the economy is tanking. We need to learn to ask questions because we're impacted by it. We need to be a people that have critical thinking skills. We just don't believe what everybody tells us. Not, don't even believe me if it's not in the Word and I'm not teaching it to you. Don't believe me, I'm telling you. And the minute I stop teaching the gospel and preaching the truth, kick me out of here real quick like. And bring in a man that will do it. I'm telling you. Paul is, did I sound like, I'm trying to portray Paul. He's basically, what's that? I don't think so, but anyway. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Why are you believing something else? Let's go to the next verse because I think at this point um, it's pretty clear that they understood that he was crucified. They understood that they needed their sins forgiven. They understood that they needed to put their faith in that work that he did at Calvary's cross. They had accepted it, received it, and now they're vacillating back and forth between his message and this message that was brought in that was false. I'm going to do my little silly analogy again. 
So I got in my hand a daisy. And a daisy has a lot of little white petals. And I could be saying, it's by grace, it's by the law. It's by grace, it's by the law. It's by grace. Oh my gosh, there's one petal left. Today it's by the law. Salvation is by the law because my I I I took look, I ran out of petals on it. It's by we don't go back and forth. One day you're saved by grace, the next day you gotta do this and then don't do that. No. Now, let me clarify. We're not saved by works, but our salvation produces works. It's proof you're saved, but they don't save you. It's the evidence, it's the fruit that the Holy Spirit, and we're going to get to that right now, is living in your life and that you have accepted the truth. And therefore, it produces from that seed of God's Word fruit. Amen? So, let's see what he has to say in this next section. And let's look at how they originally had been converted. He says, let me ask you this. He's still asking questions. He's still asking questions. Did you receive the Spirit by works? And let me add this in there. By human effort. Okay. That's what we were talking about when we say works. Specifically, Paul's referring to the works of the law. And just to make it simple for you, l- let's just keep it at the Ten Commandments. And believe me, just those ten will help us to understand. Because there were way more than Ten Commandments, according to, if you go back into the Old Testament, especially the, past, the first five books, you know, ex- Exodus, Deuteronomy, Le- Leviticus, uh, and all, uh, you know, the Old Testament, the law, where it was written. There's way more than Ten Commandments, but these are the more popular ones. He's saying, so let me put it this way. Do you receive the Spirit? What Spirit? The Holy Spirit. Did you receive it by keeping the Mosaic Law, or did you receive it by hearing with faith? This is the question. What do you guys think the answer is? You have A, works of the law, B, hearing of faith. Oh, my goodness, you guys are good. (laughs) B, you had a 50% chance there, Steve. But I'm going to say this. He's trying to have them come to a logical deduction. Again, stressing the fact that it's okay for us to think as Christians. We don't park our brains out in the vestibule and show up here, and we're nothing but emotions. We have emotions. We love the Lord. We shout out to the Lord. We raise our hands. But it's not just emotion. It's also having a little bit of reasoning. Because isn't it Isaiah that says in his first chapter, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Reason together about what? About the fact that we need a Savior. About the fact that we're sinners. This is a, let me ask you this question. Only this one. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? So, here is what I think Paul is trying to say. This is incredible to me, he's saying, how easily you guys have been duped. How easily you have been tricked. It's a second rhetorical question. We already saw the first one in verse 1. This is another one. He's saying, I don't get this idea The notion that sinful, weak, fallen human nature could improve on the saving work of the Holy Spirit is ludicrous. If Christ went to die for the sinful nature and the fallen nature, how can that fallen nature improve on what Christ did already for us? It can't. But that's what they were teaching. You guys see where we're at now? This is the thesis. This is the position that Paul's taking against that and responding to those false teachers. No, the the flesh is weak. Even when Jesus was praying in Gethsemane before the cross on the, the night where he would be betrayed and the night that he would be judged and the night that he would go and, uh, uh, and march up that hill, Calvary's hill, even on that night he says, Lord, You know, the flesh is weak, 
but the Spirit is willing. He understood that he was not going to be able to accomplish that for which the Father sent him on his own strength. Because the flesh is fallen. It's weak. And so that idea was kind of ludicrous to Paul. And so he's basically saying this. I found another version. It's a New Living Translation. It says this. After starting your new lives in the Spirit, just the same verse but differently said, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? That's what he's saying. Amen? You guys see that? And so this is what's important. We receive the Spirit not by works. We don't receive the Holy Spirit because we're good. We don't receive the Holy Spirit because we did this and didn't do that. We receive the Holy Spirit because He's good. Who's good? God's good. We receive the Spirit because He's good. Remember Nicodemus' encounter with Jesus? And he went to him and said, hey, what must I do to, to inherit uh, the kingdom of God? And he said, oh, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, although he was a rabbi, and he should have known the answer because the Old Testament speaks of the Holy Spirit working in the future of Israel. He says, huh, surprises me that you don't know. Uh, and then Nicodemus said, well, is it like I would like enter my mother's womb again and be born again? And he said, no, this is not carnal. This is not flesh. This is something spiritual. And he gives an analogy of the Holy Spirit and wind. You see the wind or do you not see the wind? No, but you see the impact of the wind, don't you? When it's blowing hard and how the leaves fall off the trees. The Holy Spirit comes out of nowhere and he begins to move in our hearts and to move in our lives where, wherewith otherwise we would be dead to the work of God, and he begins to deal with us. Do you remember your conversion? Mine started way before I said yes. I remember that there would be nights where I was alone in my room at two in the morning, and I was miserable. And I remember there were even those nights where every, the, the feeling of something's wrong was so heavy that I would weep, and I didn't even know why. I just knew I wasn't happy. I just knew I didn't have the answers. And then the Lord brought into my life people that shared the gospel with me. And I ran to Christ. And I haven't been the same since. The Holy Spirit works in our lives even before we know who He is. It's nothing you did. You don't deserve it. We don't deserve it not something you can earn or even buy. You're not even aware of it. And the Holy Spirit, Spirit begins to convict us, to make us see our ways. And then we begin to have a hunger and understand that we need something we don't have and can't find. That's why people get involved with drugs. Oh, that's why people get involved with different addictions or different things, uh, relationships, uh, mar uh, you know, women, uh, uh, power, fame. It, it, they're trying to fill this, this empty hole. They, they, they can't, and they'll spend a lifetime never finding it. Or by God's grace, he finds you. You don't find Jesus, he finds you. A lot of people in Christianity say, I found Jesus. How can you find him? He wasn't lost, you were. He found you. Where did he find you? Wherever you were in a ditch or wherever you were hiding or whatever or not even aware, he found you. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And you re recognized that he was tapping at the door of your heart, waiting patiently for you to let him in. Now you say, well, I've never had that experience. You're having it right now. <laughs> You're hearing it. And if you have it, but you know you need it, ask him right now. And where you're sitting, into your heart. Have a conversation that's real and true and genuine. He will not reject you. And he's not surprised by who you are or what you do. He's still willing to extend a hand of mercy and offer you grace. 
that he will reach to where you can't reach. We can't reach him, but he reached us. So do Paul saying, let me ask you this. Did you receive the spirit by works? Something good you did, some ritual you followed, some candle you lit, some chant you chanted. I guess a chant is a chant. No. It was because you heard the word of God and faith sparked in your heart. And that, too, is a work of the Holy Spirit. And when you sense that, you said, And he opened your eyes and you kept saying, yes. Because for the first time in your life, you were who you were supposed to be. And what is that? In fellowship with the creator who loves you. And you found that it was different than anything you've ever known. Because you weren't created to be fallen. You weren't created... To be broken. What's interesting about the word salvation, it's the word soterion in Greek. It literally means to restore. And it's used often in mending broken bones. So what happened to man that was made in God's image and perfect, because that's what the Lord said on the sixth day. Every day he said what he created was perfect, even man. Yet, the fall came, right? When the fall came, this perfect creation known as man made an image of God. That image was fractured. What good is your... Well, I'll give you an example. Morton, the pitcher for Lana, got hit in the leg, and he pitched for a couple more batters with a broken leg, but he had to stop because you're not supposed to be able to function right with a broken limb or a broken bone. It's fractured, but is it, there, is it still there? Is your leg still there even though it's fractured? Yeah, well, are you still there even though your soul has been fractured? Yeah, it's just not working right because it's fractured. Jesus comes to restore the fractured brokenness of our fallen humanity. And he mends it. That's what the word soterion means, mend, to, to heal, to restore. It's like when you find an old... Okay, I, I like a 1966 Mustang, to be honest with you, okay? I know the Camaros look nice, too, but not me. I, the windows are too small. I can't see out, out of them. And you go to, like, old Farmer John's barn one day uh, back in old uh, Arkansas, and there's one just sitting there all rusty, but I bet it could be fixed. I bet it could be restored. I saw a friend of mine do that. With, I, I can't restore hardly anything. I have a hard time using tape. <laughs> I got a piece of paper this morning. And it's, I tape and it still looks weird. But this guy took, took a, an old 1966 Mustang and he started undoing it, like tearing it apart and put, dipping it in a certain solution to get the rust off and then sanding it, priming it. There's a whole process. And then he painted it this really, really bright orange. And it's beautiful. And then he worked on, you know, obviously at the same time working on the engine, the suspension, the brakes, everything. And there it was one day, just this gorgeous car, and it looked exactly or maybe even better than it when it came out of the factory. That's what the Lord's doing with us when we have an encounter with him. He wants to restore you back to fellowship with him. And that is a healing first of our souls and our, then our relationships and then any, everything else that's broken because of sin. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the spirit because you, of something good you did or is it because of something good he did? When you hear of his goodness, that's hearing with faith. And you say yes. I accept this gift that you're offering me, gift being free, knowing that there isn't anything I can do to be right before you, righteous or just, because the just shall live by faith. No more.
it can be no comma, no semicolon, no parentheses to emphasize something else. The just shall live by faith. And I'm coming up to that verse in a little while. It's in here somewhere. I just jumped there. It's kind of previews of the verses to come instead of previews of the movies to come. It's previews. Let me ask you this. Can you guys answer this question today? If, I, if you can, I've, I think I've done my job. The question is, how do we receive the Spirit? We received it by faith. Let me say this, too. Faith is something that I practice or express which provides for me something the Lord is giving me for free. So the only real thing I can do, and the true expression of faith is this. This is how simple it is. I learned to say, thank you, Lord, even though I'm sitting here today in this pew, I ask of you to forgive me because I'm aware I'm a sinner, and I ask of you to give me the promised Holy Spirit. And if there's going to be a change in your life, if you're going to change your behavior, he's got to first change your heart. Not the pastor, not your buddy or your wife nudging you next to you. The Holy Spirit will take care of changing you. I don't have to. And guess what? I don't want to. Because it would be a futile task. I would end up failing. Let me give you an example. Has anyone here ever seen uranium? Do they know that there is a bomb made with that? There are nuclear plants that produce energy from uranium, plutonium. What do they emit? They emit radiation. Do you know that if you are exposed to radiation long enough, it changes your cells, thus making you sick with cancer or something as horrible? How many of us know that? Like when we had this uh, Russian uh, kind of a China syndrome, Russia-China syndrome, and they say that the rods in a nuclear plant got so hot they burned through the core, all the way through the core of the earth that they would end up in China. That's why it's called the China syndrome. Those rods. Well, that force that you can't even see, they can measure it. We went to Ranger Stadium uh, the last time I went to Dallas. Sam and I went to go see a, a baseball game with the Rangers, uh, their new stadium. And my dad, who has, he's a bionic man, he has two hips and two knees that have been replaced. He has metal all over him. And they ran, uh, it's really interesting, at the stadium they run that, wa that, that wand to see if you have any kind of radiation. Because maybe you have a bomb. And my dad went off. <laughs> Come here, sir. My dad went over there. They put a red band on him. And we're like, well, gosh, that's not embarrassing. But the good part was that the tickets that we bought that were up in the nosebleed didn't have us sit there. They put us in a special s suite. <laughs> he said, my dad was radioactive. What am I trying to say? If an element like uranium or plutonium can enter into your body and change your cell structure, and the laws of the physical world are obviously in action, believe me when I tell you the laws of the spiritual world, world are much more powerful, and the Holy Spirit, if He resides in your heart, He will change you. I don't need to. I don't need to. I can't even change me. I barely had a 
good morning and changing into my, from my PJs to this. I think I match. Do you guys understand what grace is? Thanks, Dee. I appreciate that. I love you because I have the Holy Spirit in my heart. I'm just trying to get you to understand. Don't let the world convince you that the Holy Spirit and that God doesn't have power because you see the power of the universe that he created. It's simply his handiwork. But in the case of plutonium that has the ability to influence or impact you with cancer, why can't the God of this universe who is good and loving and merciful not change you for the good? He can. And he does. Just hang around him a little while, and you'll begin to change. I mean, it works in, in a marvelous way because you begin to realize that, well, I'm a different person than I used to be. You know, I'm, I used to get mad about that, and now I don't. Now, there are some things in my personal life where I remember I was getting angry quite a bit, even as a Christian, and I remember that I spent one uh, period of my walk saying, Lord, why is it that that angry, why is it that I'm angry? And he let me know. It took time. But I kept asking. There it is again. Why am I getting, change me, Lord, change me. And I don't know if I prayed for a year or, or more, but one day he spoke to me, he says, you're angry because you want to be in control and you're not. I am. It was true. And every time I, things would slip through my hands or didn't work out the way I wanted them to, I wanted to control every single little detail. And he says, forget about perfection, Robert. I'm the only perfect one. And don't worry about what's going to happen because I'm in control because I love you and you've submitted and you trust me. And when you start to do that, you will see a change in your heart. Now that's that particular issue with me. Yours is different. Ask him. Every time you encounter something that you know is not Christ-like, acknowledge it. Say, Lord, that's not you. And it's ugly. I don't look like you, and I'm not appealing to people, and people are not attracted to me, and therefore not attracted to you. Change that part of me, Lord. Make me more like you. He will do it. Did you receive the Spirit by some good thing you did? Or some good thing he did? Easy answer. Some good thing he did. Are we saved because of who we are or because of who he is? Because of who he is. We wouldn't even know we needed to be saved. Unless a light shone on our lives. I got to verse 2 today. I think I did good. <laughs> Let me say this. I think I might be able to go a little bit further and then we'll call it a, a day. Paul says in verse 3 the following. Are you so foolish? Again, it's for the second rhetorical question. Having begun, oh, having begun in the Spirit, are you foolish enough to believe that you're now going to be perfected in the flesh or by the performance laws? Of laws? Can you answer the question? No. It begins in the Spirit. It starts by faith. You continue to walk day by day in the Spirit and by faith until the very last breath. It's always the Spirit. It's always by faith. It's never anything else. You don't just get saved uh, because the Holy Spirit came in your heart and then that's the last you hear from Him. He says, all right. You got saved at 10.37 on the 31st of October, 2021. See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. No. The word for the Holy Spirit that Jesus described in John chapter 16, that he would send the comforter. Not really a great translation, although he is a comforter. Not really a great translation in English. It's paracletos, which means one who walks alongside you. You are always accompanied by the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity. Don't ask me to explain the Trinity, because then I'm going to ask you to explain to me how, um, 
how liquid or gas or solids work? I don't know. The same water can be solid, it could be liquid, it could be a mist. It's all still water, just in different forms. Don't ask me to explain time to you. A, trinitar a Trinitarian concept, by the way. Time has past, present, and future. If you remove any one of the three, you don't have time. Could you have time without a past? No, because you weren't there. Well, if you weren't there, how'd you get here now? And if you're here now and don't believe in the future, well, the future is you looking at yourself tomorrow at yesterday. You say, oh, Pastor, my mind is just, you're, ooh, you're blowing my mind up. Guess what? I don't understand it, but it exists. Same thing with space, width, height, and length. You remove one, you, got, you don't even have nothing flat. Because even flat has something, width and you know, piece of paper. You ever notice how, like, for instance, I go buy paper at uh, Staples, and this one little one here, I could barely see the side. But just put 100 of these together, and you got a big fat block. Time, past, present, future, space, which is height, length, and width, water, which has solid, liquid, and mist, all mysteries to me. So I just accept the Holy Spirit as part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all working together to bring us to salvation. You know, I don't get it. I'm Okay, uh, do you have to get it to see that it actually works? No. What you have to do is let go of your pride because you think you need to know it all. No, you don't. You need to know him who knows it all. And when you put your life in his hands, all things go are well with your soul. Did you begin in the spirit? Yes. Are you now going to be perfected by your own performance? No. That's verse 3. Verse 4 says, did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed, was it in vain? In other words, have you experienced so much for nothing? And he goes on to say, um, if indeed it was in vain. Well, surely it's not in vain. Obviously it isn't. He, Paul, verse 5, I'm trying to find a place where I can stop. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works, who is it that supplied the Spirit to the Galatian church? Well, the preacher. Because they hadn't known of the gospel, they would have not known of salvation, and they would not have known of the work of the Spirit. So did I, Paul could say, but he's being humble, did, did, did I supply the Spirit to you on the basis of your works or uh, among you or so by the works of the law. In other words, the very message I preached, was it a message of works, a message of you got to keep this law and that law, or was it hearing the good news of the gospel, right? Hearing with faith. Uh, faith comes about, uh, from hearing, and hearing what? Uh, Romans 10. Hearing what? The Word of God. You hear the Word of God, and you act. You hear... The news, a lot of times, which is not even true, and you act on that, and it's not even true. But if you hear on the truth that's from God and act, believe me, it's going to produce something good in your life. Amen? I think we'll stop here. Hearing with faith. Hearing what? God's Word. Those people that came to Jesus to be healed when he was ministering for three years in all of Judea, they heard about what he was able to do, and they took a step toward him. And every one of those encounters in the Bible of, of the New Testament were all because they either heard it directly from Christ or from someone who had encountered Christ. And they ran at the prospect that they could be healed or delivered or helped in some way by this great teacher they had heard of. You can't come to him unless you hear about him. You don't get to know people by not knowing them. You have to go know them. Amen? I want you to know Christ. And I want us as a church to make him known. Amen? Because if you know him, 
it changes and makes all the difference in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Uh, thank you for Paul, who is so passionate about defending the gospel of grace, which is the only way in which we will be able to see you and know you. Make our hearts pliable, moldable, and if necessary, break them so that then we may fall to our knees and ask you into our lives, which will change everything. Do what you need to do. And it's not like you need our permission, but we give you permission. We surrender and ask, Lord, that you make of each of our lives what you intended them to be when you created us, when we were born. Not an accident at all. We all have a plan and a purpose that you have for us. Help us to fulfill it individually, but also together as a church. Would you bring us together here today? With our main goal is to share a good news that we've received, but you've asked us to share it with others. So if there's someone here today, Lord, that has never said yes, have them, Lord, I pray by your power, be able to simply accept you as their Savior, simply confess their sins, which we all have, and we ask that you give us, because our desire is to turn from them, but we ask you, Lord, to help us do that by changing our hearts in what is otherwise known as the born-again experience. May they pray that prayer by faith, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.